So good morning, um, and we'll make a make a start to uh, for this morning's event, which is um, the state of the discipline women, gender, and political science. So my name is Fiona Buckley, and I'm based here in the Department of Government and Politics. And the department, in conjunction with the Political Studies Association of Ireland and its Gender Politics Specialist Group, is hosting this um, seminar today. I suppose very much it's a, a seminar that we want to um, discuss issues around gender equality within the, the university, but also specifically looking at political science, the mm -hmm. discipline, and asking that question, is it gendered? And if so, I think we kind of know the answer, <laughs> um, how to diversify. But diversify the, the discipline and indeed the um, profession. And um, throughout the day, we will be tackling that question, but we'll also um, be um, using this forum as, I suppose, a career advisory session for early career researchers. Um, but also, um, we're delighted to be joined by a number of people from the Feminist Institutionalism International Network. So uh, we'll also have a round table specifically looking at that um, in, in, at the mid-morning stage. So at this point, all I need to say is, um, a, I suppose, a safety announcement. If there is an alarm bell, we will exit the um, room by the two doors here and just turn left and we exit the building on our left-hand side. Um, there, the bathrooms are just outside the social area on the, the left of the lift and at 11.15 we will have a tea break in the social area and at lunchtime around one o'clock we will have lunch which should be served outside our own social area in the Department of Government so we'll go up to the second floor of the building and we'll have lunch at that point. So all I'm going to do now is hand over to the Head College Professor Chris Williams to say a few words of welcome. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fiona. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here. Just as a follow-up on that uh, point about uh, fire alarms, uh, you might well hear the fire alarm go off um, periodically because uh, it's a common cultural habit in this building to <laughs> use the fire exit just down the end of the corridor as a shortcut. So don't be alarmed unless it goes on for a long time <laughs> or, you sus or you smell smoke or something like that. Um, so... Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to, to be here this morning, um, and I'm particularly uh, pleased that uh, the invitation was extended uh, to me to return later this afternoon and to be participate in, uh, in one, of the, uh, one of the discussions. I'm looking forward to that, and I'm also looking forward to listening to and learning from our panellists this morning. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm the head of the College of Arts, Celtic Studies and Social Sciences, which for those of you who don't know, UCC is one of the four constituent colleges of the institution and it contains 10 departments, including the recently renamed School of Society, Politics and Ethics, which includes as one of its, sorry, 10 schools, uh, one of which is the School of Society, Public Politics and Ethics, and one of the departments of, of that school is the Department of Government and Politics. Um, and we're delighted that the Department of Government Politics is part of, this, uh, part of the college because it's a fantastic uh, department. It's very active um, and I've been invited to, to welcome uh, colleagues to quite a number of events, probably more from this department than um, probably a number of schools put together actually over the last uh, two years. So it's, it's always really, really interesting um, to, to, to learn about some of these developments. I'm a historian. Um, and I guess, uh, I suppose I would be conscious of um, gendered patterns of recruitment to the profession in, in particular areas of history. You, you, you'd expect to see uh, probably male domination in areas of military history and diplomatic history and more traditional forms of political history, less so with uh, social and cultural history uh, and clearly less so with, with gender history, all of which have been major growth areas in the historical profession. Uh, during my career. Um, but I'm really interested to find out more about what's going on uh, in politics and government, how, uh, how that discipline is gendered, and, and I suppose really tips for what we can do to address that in terms of how institutions behave and the kinds of practices that they uh, encourage and reward. Um, I'm certainly conscious as somebody who ends up chairing and sitting on a number of appointment panels 
that we have specific expectations sometimes about what a, a strong career profile might look like and, and that those expectations are quite often I think predicated on an assumption that somebody uh, basically has been able to focus on certain types of activity uh, on a full-time basis for a set number of years in order to achieve key, key career milestones and I think you know those expectations almost, I'm sure we'll hear about it more tend to favour um, men probably more than they do women um, so that in itself is a, is a, a, a genuine issue and I um, you know I think UCC is engaged with this as an issue it is uh, it's, it's very heavily involved at the moment in various forms of Athena Swan planning um, it's preparing uh, some bids under the uh, the government's um, Sally uh, initiatives the uh, strategic Ac academic leadership initiative which is looking to appoint um, uh, female professors in a number of uh, key areas um, and as a member of the university management team you know I'm very interested to to learn uh, how we can address these issues, not just in terms of government and politics, but right across the piece uh, for all disciplines. So I won't delay us any further. I know we've got a very interesting panel coming up, but uh, very welcome everybody who's traveled to be here. And I'm looking forward to learning more today. Thank you. So good morning everybody, um, my name is Theresa Reedy and I'm from the Department of Government uh, upstairs so I'm responsible for looking after the, the first, uh, first panel. So I want to start by thanking Fiona for getting us all here, uh, here today and I think uh, even more importantly for getting the money to get us all here uh, today because I don't think there's ever a time when we in universities admit that funding is actually uh, freely available but I assure you now is not that particular, uh, not that particular time so uh, a real sincere note of congratulations and thanks uh, for all the effort that has gone into to, to putting the programme uh, together. The other thing I have to uh, start by saying is that of course we should all tweet today because it's very important that we share the message of what it is that we're going to be talking about with the rest of the world and in that vein uh, we are suggesting that you use the hashtag genderpolucc so if anybody's tweeting uh, please include genderpolucc and that way we'll be able to uh, to collate uh, the uh, the information so the the formal title for this uh, panel is women gender and political science is political science a gender discipline uh, how to diversify so I think we probably all know the answer to the first question but I think we're very interested in actually hearing um, the suggestions and the evidence that people are going to, to bring forward uh, for the second part of that question so to get things underway it's great pleasure to first call on uh, Dr Lisa Keenan um, from Trinity College Dublin although we are trying to poach her for UCC <laughs> hopefully that might actually happen um, Lisa is a lecturer in, in, in uh, uh, TCD uh, at the present uh, time her work is on public opinion and gender and politics where she publishes quite a bit in Irish political studies and uh, and other places and uh, Lisa is also the co-convener of the political studies um, Association of Ireland's gender and politics specialist group so she's particularly well placed to address the question that we're talking about today so it's my great pleasure to hand the floor over to uh, to Lisa thank you Right. Okay, uh, so uh, apologies, I can't really talk without slides, so uh, these slides are sort of um, uh, just for uh, my own sort of edification, uh, but also I have a few um, uh, tables, so uh, I always think it's better to uh, display them rather than talk through them. So, um, I'm very pleased to be here, so thank you for the invite. Um, although we know the answer to the first question, I'm going to talk through uh, what that actually looks like, right? So um, what I want to do is talk a little bit about how we can think about the problem of sort of um, gender composition um, of uh, academic staff and political science. Um, and also just sort of talk about uh, the PSAI as well and some of the initiatives that the PSAI um, is actually sort of um, carrying out and also things that we're hoping to do in the future to sort of address this issue. Um, so first of all, um, we can think about sort of uh, broadly the problem of sort of um, 
women and academia, right? So we know that in general, um, there are more men than women in academia, right? There's World Bank data on this. Uh, the more sort of, the most recent data that they have is from 2017. So um, essentially there's approximately 41% of uh, women in academia versus obviously conversely 59% of men. This is sort of generally high and this is for um, the high income countries only. The EU um, average is roughly the same. Um, for some reason, they don't have more recent data on the Republic of Ireland, which is obviously what I want to talk about today. So they only have it going back to 2009. But in 2009, there were 38% of women, of uh, academic staff were women. Um, and at the time, that was slightly above the EU average. There's no reason to expect that this has changed. Um, and obviously, we can be a tiny bit skeptical about this because the extent to which uh, you know uh, the World Bank is defining academic staff, they're sort of rolling a lot of things into that, right? So we can kind of be a little bit skeptical. Um, okay, so what I want to talk about sort of more more um, specifically is women in political science in the Republic of Ireland. So we can think about this in kind of two different ways. So. First of all, we can think about the gender composition of departments, right? So uh, how many men, how many women? Um, and then also we can think about uh, the gender composition of sort of relevant political, uh, relevant professional associations, like, for example, the Political Studies Association of Ireland, which is obviously what I'm going to talk about today. So if we just look at um, the gender composition of departments, and this comes with a big caveat, right? So these are my own figures. Um, I've sort of coded these myself from websites from uh, relevant departments. So this is just for five departments from the Republic of Ireland. So UCD, DCU, UCC, um, TCD and UL. Um, their kind of information is sort of good on the website in terms that you're able to sort of go on and identify that these people are in fact studying political science. Um, these figures don't include people who are emeritus professors. Um, and they don't inc include visiting lecturers, but they do include teaching fellows and they do include adjuncts. OK, and um, so these, they should be treated as a sort of uh, indicative rather than definitive. But there's sort of approximately 31 percent of our uh, departments are made up of women and the rest okay. obviously being men. And um, if we strip out the sort of the, the teaching fellows and the adjuncts and just look at um, the assistant professor, associate professor, or professor titles, um, we can see that what appears to be happening is, is that women seem to be clustering in the assistant professor level. Um, and then there are there appear to be fewer as you go sort of higher up. Now, this isn't necessarily surprising, right? If you think about, say, for example, um, if historically women haven't been going into the profession, then you wouldn't suddenly expect, say, if in the 90s more women go in, mm -hmm. that you'd suddenly have tons and tons of professor level women, right? But uh, it is sort of interesting to see that um, we do obviously have this little bit of a, a split. So we can think also about sort of the composition of the PSAI as a sort of relevant uh, professional association in Ireland. And this is from uh, a gender audit which was carried out by Claire McGing, who unfortunately couldn't be with us here today. Um, but uh, she carried out this gender audit in, for the period 2015, 2018, and she has um, data going back on her membership um, obviously starting in 1999. Um, and we can see sort of generally the sort of in and around a third of the membership uh, are female. And um, the 2018 figure is a little bit lower because we get these from Taylor and Francis. Taylor and Francis are not necessarily very up to date with the data they released to us. So the, the 2018 figure will actually be higher once we get it um, at the end of this year. So there wasn't a sort of a massive drop off where women started fleeing the PSAI. So just be aware of that. Um, OK, so if we look at sort of the composition of the executive committee, um, it's also approximately a third of the executive committee are women. Um, this is sort of, um, sorry, this is actually uh, lower than sort of other associations. So if you look sort of um, internationally at other professional associations, the kind of average for those is approximately 44%. Uh, um, that's if we look at the uh, IPSA. Um, so we're a little bit below average, but obviously this is a sort of a significant improvement on previous years. And um, also uh, we can think about the kind of um, the policies that we have in the PSAI, right? So um, not that the interest in gender is sort of um, recent, but um, it's sort of uh, been getting more attention, shall we say, at the executive committee level in recent years. So in 2014, there was the creation of the, the post of gender mainstreaming officer, um, which is sort of 
change to um, equality and diversity officer. Um, and the sort of the remit with that was to pay attention essentially to these types of gender issues. Um, so in 2015, there was a decision made at executive committee level that there was going to be a sort of a more of a focus on highlighting the achievements of women in the profession. Um, so one of the things that they wanted to do essentially was with the prizes, they had made a decision that they wouldn't name any more prizes after men until they had named a prize after a woman, right? So to sort of improve uh, visibility of women in the profession who've achieved things. So in 2018, the Elizabeth Meehan Prize, uh, which is the best paper prize, was created. Um, also, there was this decision to uh, carry out this gender audit every three years, and then for those results to be presented every three years at the AGM, right? So to keep the membership up to date about what is sort of happening um, in the association and where we stand in terms of the gender composition. Um, and also, um, there's kind of been a decision to think more uh, fully about gender balance and incorporating gender balance into conference programming. Um, so in 2018, only 6% of the panels were all male panels. And this obviously is uh, kind of uh, down from 25% in 2015. So there's more of a, um, a focus on ensuring that uh, we don't have panels that are segregated by gender. Obviously, we don't necessarily want to get rid of um, all panels being single gender panels. And the reason I say that is because we would be in trouble with mm -hmm. our gender panels. Uh, but it is something that we want to kind of uh, pay attention to. Um, so in terms of kind of uh, future initiatives that we're thinking about and things that we want to achieve, um, what I would like to do is do an annual gender audit, not necessarily to present that annually at the AGM, but I think that actually what we should do is we should improve access to that information. So you don't need to be at the AGM uh, to receive the information. Uh, we do have a blog associated with the PSAI, so it would be nice after every conference if there were a small write-up of uh, the data and we can kind of track where we're going. And then also to, to kind of make that information available and make that information kind of uh, just accessible to other associations who might be interested. You know, the, the PSA, for example, has a lot of initiatives that they're um, keen to trial and to, to um, carry out. So it will be nice to be able to kind of share information in that way. Um, also, uh, it will be nice for us to uh, put on events or more events for kind of early career researchers. Um, it seems a shame to get big names to come and speak at the conference and then not to also ask them if they would, wouldn't mind doing something in, in the way of a workshop or something for early career researchers as well. I think that would also potentially um, attract uh, more members and sort of get people more engaged, which would be nice as well. And, and finally, uh, one of the things we're thinking about doing is doing either a survey of um, <coughs> conference attendees or the survey of the, uh, of the membership uh, to find out from members what they actually want us to be doing and what they actually think would be useful for us to do rather than just assuming that people want certain kinds of things. Um, so that's it from me. Um, thanks very much. Thanks a million, uh, Lisa. It's great to get the morning started with some fairly concrete data to, to give us a, a structure to continue the rest of the uh, of the debate. Um, it is a tremendous pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Yvonne Galligan uh, to you uh, to you next. Uh, Professor Galligan is a towering figure in gender and politics um, in. Um, in Ireland, so it's wonderful to have her here uh, today. She's also uh, late of, of UCC some uh, some years back, but is presently uh, the Director of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion, and also Professor of Comparative Politics at the uh, Technological University in Dublin. Uh, she has written extensively on uh, gender and politics, is a former President of the Political Studies Association of, of Ireland, is currently Honorary Treasurer, Treasurer of the uh, PSA in the uh, in the UK. Uh, she received an OBE in 2014, an honorary doctorate from the University of Edinburgh in 2017, and those are just some of the, uh, the accolades. So you can see why it is such a pleasure to have her here with us today and why I'm so looking forward to hearing what you have to say, Yvonne. You're very welcome. So you're, you're very, very kind. Thank you very much for that uh, very warm uh, introduction. Um, I hope I live up to the <laughs> words. <laughs> 
Um, uh, as uh, I don't have a PowerPoint, um, and I, I decided not to have a PowerPoint because, um, as Teresa has said, I have been involved in that issue for this issue for a very long time in many different ways. Do you want me just? I just turn it, turn it off altogether. Yeah, sorry. All right. Okay. You can see going on. All right. Turn so, um, so I thought I would uh, just maybe share some uh, reflections with you. Reflections. Um, where I feel we have, as a discipline, we have a very positive story to tell, but we also have a long way to go. But definitely, um, political science is a very different place today than it was 20 years ago or even 30 uh, years ago. Uh, Lisa's figures are very accurate in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. In Ireland, uh, women were about one in five in terms of membership of uh, the uh, Political Studies Association of Ireland. And that figure kind of reflected women's uh, participation in the discipline as a whole uh, worldwide. Um, and um, in my uh, experience of being involved in the International Political Science Association um, from the mid-90s until uh, the mid-2000s, um, I have seen um, I have seen more attention being brought uh, to that uh, to that agenda uh, over over the years. Um, I am, so today uh, we find that one third of the members of large national associations are female, which is actually very, mirrors very much the uh, PSAI figure. Um, we find that about 40% uh, of the presidents of all national associations are female or were female in 2017. There's always a little bit of a lag in terms of these figures. But we're talking about 40% now, which isn't bad compared to what it used to be. Still not equal, still not 60% in favour of women. Um, about 40% of the executive committee members uh, are women in national um, associations. And uh, just under 40% of the secretaries general or executive directors of national associations are women as, as well. And in terms of the International Political Science Association itself, those figures hold, and in fact, they're slightly higher. So it's about it's it's literally 40% or 40% plus for the executive committee, for the membership of uh, IPSA, for Congress participation is 40% female. Um, 60% uh, male, and the International Political Science Review has had uh, five female editors in the last 20 years. The most recent one being Teresa Reedy here. <laughs> and the International Political Science Association is, is a really uh, many of you have published in it. I know Georgina and Louise and uh, Fiona have published in it, among others. Um, it is uh, it is one of the very few generalist political science journals left in the field. Have, most journals are very narrowly focused, with a small turnover of uh, authors, and they all cite one another. And there's a whole uh, issue around <laughs> all of that. Um, but uh, IPSR is one of the very rare uh, flagship disciplinary journals that uh, is a generalist one and serves all of political science. Um, so, um, so it's very significant in that regard. And I remember um, when I was editor of it myself, uh, so the editor change, editorial team changes about every six years now. The editorial team hadn't changed for a very long time or had only recently changed when I became editor. Um, and I remember at the time, the, there's always two editors um, and the editor at the time was Kay Lawson and James Meadowcroft had stepped down and Kay was looking for another editorial partner and there was a process and I came through the process. That was all fine. But around the uh, IPSA executive committee table, I heard murmurs such as, 
oh my god, could we have two women <laughs> edit together? <laughs> it was bad enough <laughs> to have one woman editing and one man, but two together, what's going to happen? And it was actually quite a cultural change for Ipsa to have two women editors. There was never any problem with having two male editors. <laughs> You know, but anyway, so Kay and myself took on board the editorship. We had a great partnership for six years and uh, and we grew the reach and the diversity and uh, the significance of uh, publishing gender is gender uh, topics in the journal at that time. And we think that from then on, our successors, Marion Soar and uh, Teresa, have been able to hold on to that agenda and have really, really increased and developed that agenda hugely. And I guess my message out of that is how women, when they are in positions of influence in the profession, have a duty to support women's scholarship in the profession. Mm -hmm. Whether that scholarship is on gender and politics or political economy or international relations or anything that doesn't necessarily have to have gender in it. So I think there uh, so I think that that is an important point for all of us uh, to remember and reflect on. And the reason I say that is that increasingly as we examine uh, who, who gets published and where. And we do that because in order to advance in our uh, chosen profession, we have to publish in journals and have to publish in highly cited and highly rated journals. And the research is increasingly showing that uh, women are less well represented in the top ranking journals. It doesn't mean that their scholarship isn't submitted but it doesn't get through. Um, there are biases in peer review. As we all know, peer review is a very imprecise <laughs> uh, art uh, and skill even. Um, women are often excluded from the research teams that publish in, as co-authored pieces. Um, and, and that's uh, very clear. And finally, the met methodological orientation that many female scholars take is often not the methodological orientation preferred by uh, many of the uh, top ranked journals. So all of this means that when it comes to looking at women's research as editors and as reviewers, we have to reflect carefully on the biases that are within the publication system and take those into account in making um, our, our decisions. Uh, I could say that there are many, many other areas uh, that we could look at, but I won't. We can talk about those uh, uh, to the future but uh, in, the, in the next panel. But I would like to kind of conclude um, by, by maybe thinking about how do we address these problems. I think Lisa's point about monitoring is absolutely important. It's absolutely vital because monitoring and publishing the results makes the issue and the problem visible. And when the problem is visible, then one cannot ignore it. In fact, the whole community cannot ignore it. And then the creative process of finding ways of addressing the issue begins to come about, in which women and men together in the profession are uh, part of the solution and can and can contribute ideas. Um, so I think also that um, um, professional associations that support uh, women in the discipline in all, all different ways may wish to consider adopting a somewhat more systematic approach to uh, to to supporting women in the profession through, for example, adapting maybe the Athena Swan framework, which we are all involved in as our in our institutions at the moment. 
But the uh, ECPR has very recently produced a gender equality plan which they have based on the Athena Swan model. They haven't taken all the pieces of the Athena Swan charter because not all the pieces are relevant to, to ECPR, but they have taken four or five of those principles and they have built a gender equality charter and action plan around all of that. I think all professional associations could give that some, some reflection. And the third area that I think is uh, behoven of universities and uh, 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 disciplinary associations, such as the PSAI, such as IPSA and others, is to pay attention to the gender and research nexus. To look at, for example, who are the uh, lead applicants for research funding that are coming through the association or through the university, ask, are these all male? <coughs> and if the lead applicants for research funding is completely male from any university or any association, then there has to be a problem there. If one third, if at least one third and more of your, um, of your scholars in that area are female. So I think that's something to consider. In terms of evaluations, are the evaluation teams composed of men and women and composed of different methodological perspectives? Mm -hmm. I think a very important uh, question because certainly, as we all know, in political science, um, mm -hmm. the power of the quantitative approach with its simplicity and its precision is exceedingly seductive to funders. Yeah. When the qualitative, uh, nuanced, uh, uh, very fine-grained studies are, find it harder around the decision-making evaluation table, find it harder to make a case. And I have sat around in many evaluation uh, tables, uh, international and national, and found that these are the cases that, uh, that one needs to argue for much more strongly. And the third area that, um, that I would ask everybody involved in intellectual endeavor to look at is the content of that research. Is the content of the research application, is the content of the research uh, substantive issue, is there a gender perspective being brought to bear on it? And where does that gender perspective fit in? And by gender perspective, I just don't mean a female perspective. I mean a gender perspective in the full sense of what gender means. It's not just a synonym for women. It is about masculinity and femininity and how all of those issues are built in. So for example, today there is a, a very strong focus on artificial intelligence. And yet the model, the artificial intelligence models that are built are not necessarily responsive to gender differences. That's an issue which means that the scientists that are building the platforms and the data for artificial intelligence to, to use are replicating the biases of the pre-existing data on which it is based. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something that as political scientists and scholars, as social scientists more generally, uh, we have to be uh, uh, very aware of that. So I'll just uh, end my talk there, and I'm sure there will be many other things that we can talk about in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yvonne. And it's, it's fabulous to begin a discussion with so many concrete proposals for what can actually uh, be done to uh, address the uh, 
the conversation that we're, we're having today. It's now my great pleasure to call on our final speaker, uh, Professor Fiona Mackay, who is with us uh, from the University of Edinburgh, where she is a professor of uh, politics. And it says down here that she was recently dean and head of school of social and political science, but she seems to have escaped that particular torture. <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations on coming out the other, <laughs> the other side of uh, uh, the other side of that. Um, much more importantly, uh, Fiona is one of the feminist institutionalist colleagues. Uh, she is the um, uh, the the director of the feminism and institutional. Institutionalism International Network, um, and it's a, a great pleasure to have her here today. And I just want to highlight one particular publication of uh, of Fiona's, uh, because it is in the International Political Science Review. <laughs> and I want to uh, particularly uh, pick up on, on Yvonne's point in relation to that, because it is actually one of the most cited and most read papers that we actually have on that list. And if you go and look at her list of most read and most cited papers, actually several of them are by women authors, and quite an important number of them as well are actually on gender and gender related uh, gender related topics and I also want to acknowledge Louise Chappell who's one of the co-authors <laughs> along with Meryl Kinney That's who's right. also at the back yeah. of the uh, back of the room and I want to acknowledge uh, <laughs> <Yvonne>. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it, it's just an important point to make that that this really is one of our high, highest cited and, and, and most read uh, papers um, so it's really a call to, to action for people to, to submit uh, to submit more work because some journals certainly are very conscious of the this, uh, of this gender lens and I think IPSR is one because it was set on an early trajectory in that direction uh, by, by Yvonne and, and by um, more recent co-editors uh, as well. So uh, with that little note of, of diversion aside it is a great pleasure to, uh, to welcome you uh, Fiona and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you Teresa, thank you Fiona um, and also thank you Chris because I want to say the importance of institutional buy-in cannot be underestimated and the importance of male allies. Do people mind if I sit here? I don't have a PowerPoint, but I do have notes, and ladies of a certain age will know why. Um, so it would be quite hard to juggle it there. So people, can they hear me? Can they see me? Are you happy? Good, thank you. So I've been asked to bring a UK perspective, um, and maybe if there are opportunities in question, I can also talk a little bit about my my own institution, Edinburgh. So what I've got to say have lots of resonances with, with uh, Lisa and Yvonne's presentations and much to uh, agree with. So as in uh, the Republic of Ireland and the UK, there's been a steady and long-term increase in numbers in political science, but political science in the UK remains a relatively inhospitable uh, discipline for female academics. So in sharp contrast to, if you like, more feminised disciplines like sociology, um, women comprise today around a third of political scientists. Only 14% of female academics are full professors, compared with almost 25% of male academics. There are only three um, female political scientists of colour uh, who are full professors in the UK. Um, and what we can also see are that gendered stereotypes about the scope and the subject uh, that is uh, respectable political inquiry, that has been challenged, but they still hold quite firm. Um, surveys of the profession suggest that feminist approaches continue to be marginalised in research and teaching. So the, the question I want to ask is, are women in political scientists making waves or are they being drowned out? Um, so I've not got very much time and I'm, I'm going to reflect, I think, on a little bit like um, Yvonne on the distance travelled uh, in the discipline, the strategies employed and the impact on the field against still quite substantial uh, odds. And my overall argument is that uh, female political scientists, including feminist political scientists, have made inroads into the profession and in the discipline. But the change is slow, the context remains difficult, and gains are unlikely to stick without constant vigilance. So numbers aren't everything, but I think uh, both our former speakers have made the point, counting matters, and what is counting, what is counted matters. Um, as in the Republic of Ireland, the numbers of female and male political scientists are not routinely gathered in the UK either. Um, 
tends to rely on motivated individuals. And in this respect, Stephen Bates at Birmingham is somebody that has done the work, the counting grunt work over uh, a long period of time. Intersectionality data are patchier still, which I think also arguably tells us something about the importance ascribed to it. But what evidence we do have suggests that women and men from non-traditional backgrounds, women and men of color, and particularly women of color, face particularly challenging uh, barriers. What we can do is we can, we can chart the slow progress of female academics uh, through the institutions. So they rose from 10% uh, of the profession in 1978 to around 19% when I got my first temporary position in 1996 and rising to 36% in 2018. It is still the case that some 60% of female academics are concentrated in unpromoted lectureships and or temporary teaching and research fellowships compared with under half uh, of uh, male academics. What the data also show, uh, as uh, elsewhere um, in, in other contexts, women take on service roles including really substantial leadership positions, like heads of department, like curriculum leads, etc., when more junior than their male counterparts, who are much more likely to achieve, achieve chair, full professor, before they take on uh, such responsibilities. Yvonne talked about some of the well-documented gender gaps and gender balances that we see across the UK, across the profession internationally. Um, including around citations, including around full recognition of women as co-authors, including journal acceptance rates, promotion, and student teaching assessments. And we could go on and on. Very well established patterns of bias. We can ask ourselves, why is political science inhospitable? Um, why is it more inhospitable than, say, sociology? And I think we've got to look at, if you like, our central object of study. So politics remains an inhospitable profession, and political science, in turn, is an inhospitable discipline. And I think that this, in part, is because, as traditionally defined, politics is still bounded by that classic Western public-private divide, women relegated to the private sphere and low politics, if you like, and men associated with the public sphere and high politics. And despite many changes and challenges, to be sure, this is still one of the central focuses of political science inquiry, and there's a real kind of path dependency and legacy around that. So male dominance, we know, was assumed without critical examination, as was the acceptance of, if you like, hegemonic masculinity as ideal political behaviour. So when we think back to when pioneers like Johnny Love and Dusky and Anne Phillips began working, the idea that the chronic minority status of women in formal politics was a serious problem for democracy or an issue worthy of academic investigation, met with indifference at best mm -hmm. and incredulity and hostility at worst. Now, women are still a minority presence, but a growing minority mm -hmm. presence in political science. And actually, uh, from that position, they have, I think, uh, challenged both the dominance of men in the profession and also these masculinist, heteronormative, ethnocentric assumptions underpinning the discipline. And I've written uh, with Meryl Kennedy, with Kennedy, Kenny, sorry, recently, um, the role that feminist academics in particular have played in insisting that gender is central uh, to how we understand political processes and institutions, um, and the way in which that challenges, I think, a fundamental uh, part of conventional understanding of political life by linking public with private, formal and informal spheres, and so on. And I think in doing so, you know, they have broadened and deepened what we understand politics to be, who does politics and who studies politics, and exposed some of these gender biases right at the heart of orthodox politics. I think I'd also have to point out that actually gender and politics scholars, um, feminist IR scholars talk about good girls and bad girls, and I think that feminist political scientists are good girls, in that we're not really that bold, um, and we don't, I think, sometimes pursue that feminist analysis of politics to, to, the, to its most radical conclusions. Um, and I think that it's the case that feminist political science has actually never really abandoned its, its interest in the political uh, conventionally defined or in orthodox methods, but it wants to um, integrate gender into those. Um, 
I think it's also fair to say that despite some exemplary early uh, examples, and I would uh, cite Norris and Lovendusky's classic study of gender, race, and class in the House of Commons, that an intersectional political feminist political science is only just beginning to emerge and is still baby steps. So I want to think um, about the pioneers and the generations that came afterwards and what strategies they've employed. And I want to pay tribute to that first generation, to pioneers like Johnny Lovendusky, Vicky Randall, Elizabeth Meehan, who we've talked about, and Pippa Norris, who took on the academy in the 1970s and 1980s. And they had that dual strategy, if you like, to engender the curriculum and to build feminist institutionalist spaces, institutional spaces within the discipline. Um, and a good example of that is, is our own political studies association, the PSA, and the women in politics group within that, which for 30 years has operated, I think, to develop politics and gender as a subfield on the one hand, but to also act as a caucus for women in the profession and have had played such an important job on calling out time and time again everyday sexism and institutionalised discrimination. These women also took on leadership roles in the discipline. They pushed their way onto executive committees. They pushed their way into things like exercises around benchmarking the profession and so on. And many also took on leadership roles in their institutions. And what they also did along the way was they mentored, encouraged, supported, sponsored, wrote endless refer uh, references to the generations that came after. Now, I'm part of that next generation. It's a pretty big generation because there were so few opportunities. It's probably a generation of almost 15, 18 years or so. Um, and I sometimes do wonder what that first generation thinks of us. If you like, our job was then to institutionalise the advances made, but that came also at time. Um, a really palpable intensification of work, the quickening pace of neoliberalising reforms around audit, performance, management, marketization, and so on. Now, I want to make the point that, um, and in fact, Yvonne has already beautifully made the point, that these trends have offered both opportunities as well as pitfalls. So there have been opportunities, if you like, to instrumentalise uh, equality and diversity as efficiency, to make market-based arguments for specialist gender appointments and the expansion of the curriculum. But of course, as we know, uh, those strategies come with the risk of co-option and dilution and becoming what Nancy Fraser has called handmaidens of neoliberalism. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to finish up now by thinking where does that leave us? <laughs> um, and the long march through the institutions continues and female academics and I think feminist female academics in particular have worked through professional organisations uh, and have worked through their own institutions and networks. Externally, I think that what they've done is they've challenged discriminatory structures and practices in the discipline and staked a claim, if you like, for equal status. And within their own institutions, they've pressed, for example, to make recruitment and promotion processes fairer and more transparent, diversify the curriculum, and challenge prevailing models of, acad of academic excellence in both the traditional and the neoliberal uh, academy. I do not want to be nostalgic about what the academy was like mm -hmm. before neoliberalism. Now, I think that the entry of women and the growth of feminist scholarship are related. And by that, I am not saying that all women do feminism, nor that all feminism is done by women. But the presence of feminist scholarship and academic fem feminism provides, I think, both symbolic and substantive resources. So there was a study done now almost 20 years ago by Dean and Oscar of women managers, which showed how important the presence of academic feminism was in an institution as a resource, because what it did was it enabled critical readings of both traditional and neoliberal versions of knowledge claims, uh, of academic excellence, of success, and so on. So as Yvonne says, I think being a, a, a female political scientist, particularly if you're a white woman, uh, particularly if English is your first language, is now much easier uh, than it was for that first generation of pioneering women. But progress is really slow, it's varied across different institutions and is subject to setbacks. Uh, in the UK, we're gearing up for the next REF. There will be game playing by institutions that will, without vigilance, uh, result in differential impacts on women and men. There'll be heroes and zeros. There'll be um, people's contractual status uh, under threat and so on which is why I hope at some point we talk about this new Irish decision about <laughs> hiring female professors, which sounds really great. So I'll just end up by saying women in political scientists, I think, are both making waves and are in ever-present danger of being drowned out. <laughs> Thank you.
thank you, Fiona. You had some great lines in there. That is a, a, a fantastic way to, to finish. I, I think it's lovely as well to hear about some of the trailblazers in political science. Mm -hmm. I have them um, kind of mentioned um, in, in the course of the, the contribution while situating it in this kind of wider institutional logic as well. So thank you. That's a, a really important contribution. So at this point, I'm going to hand over the, the floor to uh, to the audience and uh, take some questions. So if you, I might take two two or three together, if that's if that's okay, um, and, and that way we can have a kind of a slightly broader conversation. So Margaret, it's a pleasure to come to you first. Thanks, Teresa. Hey, look, I think I'm going to go to any of the people on the panel. Um, do you know, there's I come from the other institution in comparative institution here in Cork City, right? I did my, all my studies here in UCC, right? So I have a reasonable grasp of both. Last year, or two years ago, 2016, they had uh, 13 professors, full professorships. Um, two of them were women. Now that was two better than it would have been, mm -hmm. right? But this is just anecdotal, but I, you have the hard data of the two out of 13, and then the softer data of some, I would be the feminist, when we know as being class and gender and intersectionality, would be my interest. But what was said very clearly, and it was said in a colloquial way, in a jokey way, I presume you'd be going to that, basically the first professorial um, talk given by one of our uh, female professors. Now, it was said in a jokey way, but I just think it tends to, um, I suppose, mirror the, the way even now, 2019, well, 2018 as it was, women are still, even at professorship level, still marginalised in the institution. Now, I know it's reflective of what you've been speaking about here, but I, I do think it's about being taken seriously. And when you explain the hard data to people, how few people actually are uh, women, how many female, let alone women of colour, class, and disability, the whole gamut, and men of the same, you know, maybe to a lesser extent, but still, it does reflect an ignorance on the part of, I, I, I don't mean willful ignorance, I mean lack of knowledge of the way women have been marginalised, and I include possibilities of women and men in that story as well, but mainly women. So, like, how about getting, I'm just suggesting, how about getting the data out there to people? Because, you know, sometimes it's this, this very important data tends to be published in specialist journals and not maybe made available to your so-called ordinary person. I worked for a long time in Akmahini, so just somewhere like that. You know, mm -hmm. So just... Thanks, Margaret. Other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, Collectrin is my name, and um, Fiona and uh, um, others in the room, we would have sat in 2010 in an auditorium here in UCC, women moving in from the margins, and out of that, uh, we formed the 50-50 group, and it was a bit like what Margaret was saying, is how do we make the point to other than a room full of women, plus one invited guest. <laughs> <laughs> and Professor Collins. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, to an extent, why, why do we keep talking to ourselves? And I'd like to commend a book written by a man. Uh, why do we, uh, why do so many incompetent men become leaders? <laughs> and what, 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 <laughs> and I suppose it's, it's like we, we spoke to Labour Youth one time around gender quotas, candidate gender quotas, and we saw young men there, and they're saying, well, what's in it for us? Mm. And you see, this is, this is the point that you have to make, is that it's not just about women, that it's actually about uh, the conditions that we perpetuate in, in like the, the propensity to go to war, and the, lack, the emphasis on competition and not on cooperation, and uh, it's bad for men as well. But it, we, we really haven't won that argument, I would argue, that um, in a sense we have a lot of feminist women, and even some of the women uh, who, who get to leadership positions don't actually get it. The extent to which the world is a much more unpleasant place because particular kinds of guys 
and consequently particular types of women end up in leadership roles. And I suppose the, the question is, how, how do we change that? How do we make it that when you, you organize a conference like this, that the guys turn up just as much as, as, mm -hmm. as, the, as the women? Mm -hmm. Thanks. There's, there's one other question. I'll just uh, take three together if that's okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for all your talks. My name is Arpita. I'm a postdoc in DCU now. Um, it is very encouraging. First of all, I just want to say it is very encouraging to hear Lisa and Yvonne and uh, Fiona talk about e early career researchers. I was just thinking of two points. Uh, first is, when I came in Ireland five years ago to now, there has been a radical change in the number of uh, PhD researchers of color. Uh, I think you would agree, like, for example, in GCU where I am, uh, the research students, the PhD students office has more of uh, non-European students, while the professors are, you know, mostly completely male and white, as you say. So there is like a whole contrast there. So I was just thinking, like, in that sense, probably the point that Fiona was making, that y your generation got the support of the first generation of feminists, I think there is a whole generation of PhD students coming up here in Ireland, especially after Brexit and all of that, you know. So who would probably need that same kind of uh, help and guidance from people, from researchers of who are in uh, eminent positions and policy making positions. And the second uh, point that I wanted to say was to Lisa. And I was uh, hearing your points about PSAI with much interest. And something that I faced personally was that when you transition from PhD to postdoc, uh, because you're not allowed by IRC to do, uh, it's a small point, but it's because you're not allowed by IRC to do your postdoc in the same institute where you've done your PhD, what happens is that basically your university loses interest in you as a postdoc candidate. But then you would have to establish your own contact with another university, which is often hard for migrant students of fellow like me because you do not have any established Thank you. That's, that's a very interesting um, suggestion. Can I throw the, the, the floor back to our, our panel there? I don't know if anybody wants to take any one of them in any particular uh, particular order, but I, I'll come to you for a few okay. Okay. And, and, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think I'll take them in the order they were asked. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I think it's yeah, it's a really thorny question, isn't it? We are still marginalised in oppression. How are we taken seriously? And, and I think over and above that, the way that as women have made inroads, uh, that has been experienced as loss by the privileged group, which we would, would, we would know that uh, 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 anyway. I mean, I think there are lots of things that have happened over the years, and some of it is buying into I think, what Louise Morley calls the prestige economy of the institution. So the advantage, if you like, of, of metrics is that quite often women uh, and feminist scholars can actually hit those metrics. Um, so I think we use everything at our disposal. We remain, we retain a kind of scepticism, uh, but nonetheless we, we play by the rules of the game around prestige. I think Athena Swan is a really, I mean, I've got some real um, issues with Athena Swan, but I think it's very important institutions like um, League tables, they like uh, measurements. So I think that that's a very important way to a get those figures out there because actually your department, your school, your university as a whole has to produce those figures. Um, and um, I think that what we've also got to do is is continue to chip away at some of those um, those knowledge claims. So I think it's those sorts of three things. It's around the curriculum, how knowledge is um, constructed. It's playing the prestige economy game, and it's um, making sure that if there are if there's monitoring to be done and audits to be done and um, league tables to be um, <coughs> risen up. Um, there's a new uh, Times Higher league table, and I don't know if one of you sort of spotted that, um, an impact one, which is tied up with the SDGs. So that, I think, will allow the work in universities to, if you like, piggyback on all that hard work by the women's movement in getting the standalone um, Sustainable Development Goal 5 and also getting some gender perspectives across all the other Sustainable Development Goals. 
So it means that, again, it's another institutional incentive, and I know it's instrumentalizing, but it's another institutional incentive for, um, uh, for uh, people to think about gender balance within teams, uh, to think about uh, where feminist work, gender work has been published, um, and other sorts of, sort of both institutional and disciplinary um, uh, triggers. Um, why are we talking to ourselves? Uh, Jolly Love and Dusky um, uh, has a wonderful phrase where she talks about how often we've reached out to the mainstream, but it's still not very clear that anybody's listening. Uh, so short of press gang, um, <laughs> you know, I think it is a serious problem, um, uh, but, um, uh, but we aren't there yet. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, the question about mentoring and, and sponsorship. I hope that our generation does has taken that seriously and one of the lessons we were taught was paying forward. Um, and um, you know I think that we have done a lot of mentoring and sponsorship. I think there's a long way to go uh, around that and I do think we need to think hard uh, about intersectionality and, and sponsorship um, and also how work around decolonizing the academy again, also feeds into these uh, wider issues. Thanks. Thank you. Yvonne, can I come yeah. to you? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, uh, many of those questions are ones that strike the heart of uh, the issues that we're discussing. And what we actually are discussing is um, a, a system and a culture of power and privilege. That's mm -hmm. what we're talking about. Now, there is no disciplinary group better equipped to understand and address issues of power and privilege than the people who study politics. So I think we should be the ones naming it and teasing it out and trying to understand it and not being sidelined by, uh, by things like, oh, it'll be OK, it just take another generation to happen. No, it won't. This is all about some people securing their power and their privileged position in a profession over other people. And that is not saying male versus female. This is saying how some people of all descriptions have, uh, sustain, sustain their, their positions over others. And I think it's up to us to call that out. Um, I think in calling it out, I think we have a number of tools at our disposal, and I think one of our strongest tools are our male allies in the profession. People like Neil, who for a long time, a long, long time, have championed women uh, in terms of uh, his uh, employment practices, and in terms of the positions that he has taken up in the profession over many years. And so our male colleagues who are supportive of us are the people that we should be having at our side and speaking with, and enabling and empowering them to speak with us and for us in their arenas. Uh, it is certainly in the work in all the uh, equality work that I have done, I have found that sometimes my voice will not be listened to, even though I might have both the experiential knowledge and the intellectual knowledge. But the voice of a senior male ally of mine will be listened to by other men. So deploying the strength of that in supporting what it is we want to achieve, I think, is very important. Um, I think it's also um, looking at uh, our profession. I think it's also really, really important to have those spaces uh, where, as Jane Mansbridge says, we can, as uh, female members of the profession, in all our diversity, crystallize our interests. Because we need that space too. Uh, to be able to articulate for ourselves what our needs as scholars in the profession of political science are, or, or our needs as scholars within the academy more widely. And I think those spaces are very, very precious. And again, I want to pay tribute to Fiona for uh, 
for creating that space today for us and for her long support and, and steering and leadership of uh, the Gender Politics Study Group of the PSAI that now Lisa and Claire and others have taken on and are moving forward. Uh, and finally, final point is, um, it troubles me, like you Fiona, that sometimes the only way our voices are heard are through using a neoliberal discourse in the academy. I understand the utility of it and the importance of using whatever language is the language that enables us to gain a purchase in that uh, larger space uh, of determining what the priorities of a university are or a profession are. But they are neoliberal and it does trouble me. So. Um, again, I think that as politics scholars, we have, the, uh, we have the tools to be able to interrogate that in a way that others uh, uh, may not in other professions and in other disciplines. Uh, and uh, there, more recently, uh, my uh, colleague, Dr. Scarlett <coughs> Lavero and I have been kind of teasing and tossing about this uh, concept of epistemic justice and using that as a way of leveraging power and privilege that goes unstated in Athena Swan agendas, uh, although it is there. But I think we need to, you know, turn our minds to those ideas as well. Uh, so to remain healthily skeptical while also working within system. Thank you. That's a, a very positive um, contribution. Lisa, I'm going to give you the last word. Oh, of course. Um, <laughs> yes. Okay. So I guess I have a, just a few points. Thank you for the, uh, the suggestion. I think that is really important. Um, I am perhaps less sort of optimistic about the sort of new generation of PhD students in part because I think that the profession has changed a lot even over the last 15 years. Um, and certainly what I see from sort of PhDs who have gone, have gone ahead of me, who seemed from my perspective to be people who were very sort of smart, engaged, and would have brought a lot to the profession. Um, you know, a lot of women have decided to not go into academia because essentially what was happening was they would have to go and get a job away from their families for two years, a temporary job to potentially apply for another temporary job somewhere else to move and pack up their houses again. I knew someone who um, was having a baby with someone and she was in a different country and he was in a different country and they were both in academia. And these are also the kinds of things that um, while I am encouraged by the sort of, the great, and you're correct, that there's greater diversity in terms of the composition of uh, the par our departments in terms of the, the staff, um, I'm slightly concerned that these things are not being addressed. I think, and we'll talk about that later, but I think this is a really concerning thing. I think we're going to have a bunch of people who have PhDs who aren't working in academia because they just, they're not able to, to pack up their houses every year <coughs> to move somewhere else. Um, I think also uh, sort of on the kind of the, the female spaces and these events being held and, and men not necessarily showing up. And um, for me, in, a, in any way, it, it's not necessarily a massive problem. I think part of what we do, as this kind of has already been said, is that uh, you know, we get together, we kind of share information, we kind of uh, share techniques potentially for things that might work, and then often what happens is there are informal conversations that happen with our colleagues about these issues that they're, you know, kind of not aware of. And our department in Trinity, for example, we tend to hire a lot of American trained uh, staff, um, and there is a substantial difference between the perspective of people who are trained in America and, and the perspective of people who sort of uh, grown up in, in Europe and been trained in Europe, so um, we do spend a lot of time in the pub, sort of informally talking about these types of issues, um, and it does get tiring, and I haven't been doing it for very long, and certainly not as long as the ladies beside me, but um, it is something that you have to just keep doing and banging away at, and if meeting today and kind of getting this sort of information and, and sharing kind of things that work and even sort of uh, stories about how we sort of persuaded colleagues or got people to support um, 
different kind of uh, things that we're suggesting works, then I think it is worthwhile doing, even if we don't get 50% of the attendees in the, the room being men, I think it's worthwhile anyway. Thank you. I think that's a lovely positive note on which to uh, draw the session to a close. I have uh, borrowed 10 minutes from the next session from Fiona at the back of the room, who has agreed that we can run a little bit. So perhaps I would ask you all to be to be back at 22. But before you depart, uh, it is a great pleasure for me to ask you all to, to a round of applause for tremendous contributions um, this morning and uh, hopefully even more exciting conversations over coffee. So can we thank our speakers in the morning? Thank you.